Okay, well, John will now see a similar vision as he reports in Revelation, seen by the Old Testament prophet Daniel. And as has been in past chapters, John is allowed to witness in greater detail the end of the age. And luckily for us, it gives us a greater revelation of who Jesus Christ is. Chapter 10 brought us to the middle of the seven-year tribulation period. And it ushered that period in. It is, and it has been three and a half years as chapter 11 closes. Now there will be several scenes occurring together and overlapping. Now I have to keep in mind that John can only see and only can write down these visions one at a time as they play out before his eyes. But think of these things as happening simultaneously. So a lot of things are going on during this middle of the tribulation period. Now, what might be of note in this chapter of 13 is the opening of chapter 14, which has the Lamb standing on the rock of Mount Zion. That is certainly a sure foundation compared to how we start chapter 13 with the sand and the sea, which changes with the waves and the tides, picturing a false and unstable foundation. Now, as we have been doing, we'll read tonight's verses in the NIV, and then we'll dig a little deeper in the New King James Version. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words of blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place in those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword, they shall be killed. This calls for patient endurance and fullness and faithfulness on the part of God's people. The fury of the world's demonic realm will be directed toward those who have understood the importance of Israel in the end times, actually supporting Israel's right to exist. Now you may think that you're living in the end times today with what is going on with Israel. A lot of the world and a lot of the world's leaders are not very supportive of Israel right now, even after all they've been through. They have become the aggressors. And we as believers in Jesus Christ, knowing justice and knowing what is right and wrong, 
know that all the propaganda that is out there that the world is seeing is incorrect. But imagine that this is only a birth pain of what Israel will be going through. Nothing like October 7th has ever happened in the nation of Israel, but it will be much worse as God's word has shown us up to this point. Now, as we ended our last study in chapter 12, in verse 17, we are shown who those groups of people Satan will be warring against. It says, and the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There is assurance to the believing Gentiles in the book of Romans chapter 11 and to the Jews in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11 that those not born Hebrew are still counted as the woman's offspring. Glory hallelujah to that. Now to help us visualize the people groups alluded to in this verse, allow me to add a little color. See, this chapter ends with the dragon or Satan realizing that his time is short and attempts to destroy the woman representing the Jews and the Jewish nation. But only those Jews who have accepted Jesus as their Messiah and the Son of God. See, these are the protected, believing Jewish remnant that are taken away into the mountains. Then there is the other group, the Orthodox Jews. Those who keep the commandments of God, worship Yahweh of the Old Testament, but do not believe Jesus is their Messiah. They will be unwilling to accept the Antichrist as God, as he proclaims. And so they will be an unprotected group from Satan's anger as well. There will be the believing Gentiles. They will also lack protection. And then there will be the fourth group of people that Satan will war against. They will be revealed in chapter 14. So, John records this, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his, ten, on, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now, this is very similar to the vision that was seen by Daniel in the Old Testament, where it says, Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up a great sea. You see, the sea represents and is representative of the nations of the world. In their stirring up, it reflects the changing nature of the empires of the world. In particular, it is dealing with those empires that have an impact directly on Israel. The symbolism is the same as that of the dragon in Revelation 12. These heads most likely represent individual nations. There are horns probably representing powerful leaders. Next, John notes that on his horn are ten crowns, as seen in chapter 12. Crowns are diadems probably reflecting kingdoms or nations under a single leader's rule. There are those scholars that view Daniel's beast as representing nations. And John's beast picturing exclusively individuals. Now I think it best not to completely be exclusive in either direction. After all, God's ways are a little bit higher than my ways. A tad. Maybe a few hundred tads. Maybe a few hundred thousand tads. <laughs> so I'm not going to just say that it's absolutely going to be that way. But we do have a picture. We have to keep in mind that prophecy is not going to be specific. 
It's just going to give us enough information that when those things happen, we can go, that is it. And that's what prophecy is about. Now, there are several differences from the fiery red dragon of Revelation 12. Now, in chapter 12, the dragon is seen as a sign in the heavens rather than a beast rising out of the sea. Think about it. The dragon is who? Satan. Satan has a realm that started in the heavens. It's a spirit. It's an it's a individual, but they, he has that realm. The dragon's color in chapter 12 is defined as fiery red. The color is unstated concerning the beast. In chapter 12, the dragon has seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems or crowns. The beast of chapter 13 has seven heads, ten horns, and ten crowns. And then one final difference is that the heads have a blasphemous name upon them. See, in Daniel 7, there are four beasts representing different empires of the world at different times throughout the history of the world. The fourth beast represents the final empire in Daniel's vision and is identified as the Roman Empire. This was an early fulfillment of the prophecy at that time during the destruction of Israel in AD 70. However, what appears to be the case is that this same or similar type beast will be revived in the end times to become the dominant power in the world. Now, this seems to be being set up right now and coming into fulfillment before our very eyes as the EU has risen for the purpose, and what is their purpose? Of creating a dominant force as a group on the world stage. Numerous events have occurred in Greece, in Spain, of course the UK, and now even in Ukraine. It is as if the great sea is being stirred up, isn't it? One could easily make the case that this could be seen as a revived Roman Empire, just based on its location. Now, as far as the name of blasphemy, the word indicates something that occurs against God. John does not give us what that name is. However, this name is something that indicates this beast is supposedly a spiritual banner over the earth. It's, it's taking the place of God. The beast could very well be located in today's Rome, Italy, where the Vatican now stands. As it is already a political and religious system of power over much of the world today. It certainly could lean that way. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. In Daniel 7, a succession of beasts were viewed, representing a succession of world empires that would rise. The third of those beasts, one like a leopard, was representing the Greek Empire. Partially matches what is written here by John. Daniel says this, After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which, I had, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. You see the similarities there. Now this verse also somewhat matches the second beast, the one like a bear, and representing the Persian Empire in the Old Testament. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise and devour much flesh. This verse also partially corresponds to the first beast, one like a lion, which was representing Babylon, where it says, 
The first was like a lion and had eagle's, eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. Now what is possible is that this future beast being described by John will be a kind of a conglomeration of all of those previous empires. A world power which will unite into one terrible, horrific whole, centered possibly in Rome, Italy today. Or, there is another option. The various descriptions of the beast could match what this future empire will be like. It will be fast and efficient like a leopard. The empire will be firm and strong like a bear and it will be boisterous in its attitude like a lion. Now, either way, the symbolism will be perfectly understood once that beast arises. The book of Hosea describes something quite similar. It says this, So I will be to them like a lion, like a leopard by the road I will lurk. And I will meet them like a bear deprived of her cubs. I will tear open the rib cage, and there I will devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. This is the Lord speaking to Hosea. And he is describing an enemy that the Lord uses to refine and judge Israel. But it makes me think, why would the Lord do such a thing to Israel? Well, the Lord will explain this to Hosea in the previous three verses where it says this. Yet I am the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt, and you shall know no God but me. For there is no Savior besides me. I knew you in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. Now when they had pasture, they were filled. They were filled and their heart was exalted. Therefore they forgot me. We can see that in Israel today. Are they not so proud of their ability to shoot down 300 plus missiles that come into their nation? They accept full responsibility and credit for their achievement. But you and I know it is achieved because of the grace and the power of God. That power has always been there. We're just now after several hundred thousand years, as some people think, me, maybe a few thousand years, has been there all along. We're just now figuring it out. See, Hosea is describing a time of war against the disobedient in Israel. Now when this period is over, the Lord will have purged Israel of their wicked ways and will have refined them in the fire of tribulation. Only after this time of great turmoil and anguish, and anguish will the Lord return and bring peace to the earth. This beast then, I feel like, is not an individual, but it will be certainly be led by an individual. That individual will be the Antichrist. The dragon, we know from chapter 12, is Satan. And the beast will be ruled by a leader filled with the power of Satan. He is the lawless one spoken of by Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2.9. This wicked ruler will be filled with all of the power of Satan. And he will unleash immense destruction upon the world. And his seat of power will be one of terror and brutality. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. Now, if this symbolism is consistent in this verse, the head should be a nation. And if not a nation, then it could be the specific ruler of 
a strong nation. You see, the horns have been representing kings or powerful rulers. But it is the head that is as if it had been mortally wounded, not one of the horns. Now, a complete translation of as if it had been mortally wounded would be as if it had been mortally slain, as if it had been slain. The Greek word here is hospazo, and then the head was healed. You see, this same exact phrase, hospazo, was used, that's used here, was used of the lamb that was slain in verse 5, 6 of Revelation. Interesting that the exact same phraseology is used. And I saw between the throne, with the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. See, the head was, is slain in chapter 13, 3 that we just read, seems to be set in contrast, but also in direct comparison to the lamb. Why would that be? Well, so great is the event that the whole world marveled and followed the beast. Now, the likely analysis is that there is a coalition of nations rising out of the great tumultuous sea of humanity that will have the form and structure that we've been reading about in Revelations with ten nations and ten rulers and so forth. One of the nations will have seemingly a terminal blow to it. However, that nation will be resurrected and become a wonder for the world to follow after. Now hear me out on this analysis. The general analysis, though, of most scholars is that this will be a person who is mortally struck and comes back to life in a manner similar to Jesus Christ. Now, I certainly would not argue uh, with that interpretation. It certainly may be. But as the term antichrist is not necessarily to be opposite of Christ, but to be a false Christ, see, that individual will be making every attempt to appear as a redeemer, as the Savior, as the very Lamb of God. This could only be done by the greatest of all deceivers. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Who is able to make war with this nation? Now to keep with the narrative of the beast representing in time or like an end time alliance with nations, Satan will be the force behind it. See, the Antichrist will be the main leader of it, just as those who followed Hitler, for instance, glorified what? The greatness of the empire. The Third Reich, right? Didn't really matter if Hitler was in power. It was all about the Third Reich. See what is happening here? They're casting their allegiance to a satanic power that's behind the individual and behind the philosophy of the nation. So will be the case with those who are following after the beast. If you think about it, humans are prone to worshiping powerful governments. Think about the Roman Empire. It was worshiped as an empire. As the Caesars came and went, it was still the Roman Empire. Nazi Germany, the same thing with them. It was about the Third Reich. Think about communist regimes. How many leaders of communist nations are gone today? But yet, the nations continue, don't they? With just a different leader. What about Islamic nations? Think about those for a moment. They've had all kinds of leaders over the years, but yet it's not the leader It's the Islamic nation's heritage, the thoughts, what it stood for, that people still stand for today. 
They're not trying to please the Ayatollah. They're trying to please their perception of who God is. That is a much more powerful force than trying to follow an individual. When a nation is powerful, it becomes a source of idol worship. Such an instance will be true at the end times with some type of an alliance. The people will be saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with a nation? A great power is generally so because of a great leader. Wouldn't you agree? Someday it will be true of the beast during the end times. However, if you think about it, there are times when this is not the case. The nation could be strong, but the leader weak. The perfect example is before your eyes today on the television set every night. The United States is still considered a great power despite having a senile leader puppet. So great will be the beast's power that people will follow it and will consider it a force above all others during the end times and the tribulation. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and great blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. And he was given a mouth speaking great things. This is a reference to what is said in Daniel back in chapter 7. Where he records, I was considering the horns. And there was another horn, a little one, coming up from among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. See, the term pompous words is literally translated as great things. The end times leader will be charismatic and able to utter words to convince all of his own greatness and that the power he yields is without match. Paul clearly states this of him in 2 Thessalonians, where it says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And boy, are we falling. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The prophecies of Daniel 9 foretold these events would come about and that they will occur in connection with the presence of of this man of sin. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And remember one week represents seven years. But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. And that is where we are in the timeline of chapter 13. Seven years are granted but at the halfway mark of those seven years, the Antichrist will sit as God in the temple of God, showing himself as if he is God. Now we've had some strong rulers make some strong claims before. But man, he's going to go for the top of the top. See, the timeline has been given and the details have been explained. It will be recognized. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Folks, this is just pure and simple hate speech against God. And it's the God who is revealed in nature, just as Paul proclaims in Romans 1. People should be able to figure it out. But the charismatic nature of this Antichrist 
will blind them with his false light that they'll worship the earth. They say, ah, it's the earth. And this guy right here can control the earth. He can make it get warmer or colder. Who knows all kinds of powers that he'll demonstrate. His attacks will defame the character of the true creator. He will defame his grace and mercy, his truth. He will ridicule his love and righteousness, make fun of his holiness, justice, and so forth. He will proclaim that which is contrary to the eternal and unchanging standards that God has presented in his word. The beast will speak against the name of Jesus, the full and perfect expression of who God is. Now, he may do this by jointly denying all religions, or he may do it by speaking out specifically against the Christian gospel. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. This same satanic power given to him to speak great things is also behind his desire and ability to destroy the saints. This is a reference back to the words of Daniel chapter 7. And I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. The saints are any who are believers in Christ. They are those who will make up the great white-robed multitude that was referred to back in Revelation 7. Many will understand who Christ is after the rapture has taken place. And they will put their trust in Him at that point. They will continue to listen to, to the 144,000 and many will believe in the true Savior and Son of God. And then there'll be those who refuse to put on the mark of the beast, not because they believe in Jesus Christ, but because they're still holding on to the old commandments. They won't believe that Jesus fulfilled all of that. The Antichrist will have power to come against them and to overcome them. What John has recorded is also stated in, Jan in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, where he records, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Seems we've heard that chronology before, haven't we? Oh, but not in Daniel. And there it is. Now, it doesn't mean that this Antichrist has any true authority over the saints. It's Jesus who holds their attorney, eternal destiny in his powerful grasp. Now, the rest of the world will be under the authority of the Antichrist. During this time, some will die and receive eternal rewards, while others will die and receive eternal condemnation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, it seems to me here's an interesting phrase concerning those that do not believe in the work of Jesus Christ as their names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, if I were writing that, I could say that a lot quicker. Hey, they just didn't believe in Christ. But it says, written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. From the foundation of the earth, 
could be referring to either the book of life or of the lamb slain. Now, if it's the lamb slain, the words seem to agree with exactly what Peter wrote. Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you and for me. Now, if it refers to that book, it would kind of correspond to the verse in Revelation 17, 8, where it says this, And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they see the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Something to look forward to when we get to chapter 17. I think both are true. Christ was ordained from before the foundation of the world. And God also knew before the foundation of the world who would believe and who would be saved. All will come about exactly as his word is written. And we should have no worry that the things that are happening today or the things that will happen in the future are somehow just out of control and total chaos. No. God is still in control. The amazing truth of this particular verse is that even before the world was created, God knew that His Son would have to go to the cross and die to pay for your and my sin. Because of this truth, those willfully rejecting Jesus can only lead to one outcome, eternal separation from God. So if anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Interesting wording again, isn't it? You see, eight times in the gospel, the words, for those to hear, let them hear. It's recorded eight times in the New Testament, in the gospels. Three times in Matthew, three times in Mark, twice in Luke. But in Revelation, the phrase is also repeated eight times. Four times in chapter 2, three times in chapter 3. And for the very last time in Scripture here in chapter 13 of verse 9. The Lord is speaking to His people, asking them, begging them to listen and apply the words to their lives. I would suggest you might find it quite interesting this week if you will go and read those 16 times that phrase is used. And I promise you, you will be blessed. There's the revelation, the eight times in Revelation. I need some big ears like that. So, does verse 9 encourage us to understand what is said in verse 8? Or is it encouraging us to understand what is in verse 10? It's probably both. We did analyze verse 8. So, how should verse 10 be understood? He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity? He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. I think we're supposed to hear that. Now it seems that the purpose
person who does a certain action will have that action brought against him. But how does that play out in the tribulation? What does that mean? See, this bears the same general thought as found in Jeremiah 15. See, prior to the Babylonian captivity, the people of Judah were told that they were destined for trouble because of their unfaithfulness. So the Lord said to Jeremiah that if the people asked where they should go when this trouble comes, his answer to them was abrupt, concise, and lacking hope. And it shall be, if they say to you, where should we go? Then you shall tell them, thus says the Lord, such as are for death to death, and such as are for the sword to the sword, and as such are for the famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. Now Jeremiah continues with these same thoughts later in chapter 43, where he says this, when he, when he comes, he shall strike the land of Egypt and deliver to death those appointed for death and to captivity those appointed for captivity and to the sword those appointed for the sword. See, the Lord is telling of Nebuchadnezzar's pending invasion into Egypt and informing Judah that in a war there are casualties. That's what war is. This is the expectation. And they may be sinners, sinners or they may be saints. When the enemy comes through, he will not stop to determine who is who. So the saints must be ready to be taken captive. They must be ready to die. They must be ready to be injured, just as the sinner is. The warning has been given in advance. The saints of the tribulation period will not be immune from the terrible times that lie ahead. They will face captivity and they will face death. But in persevering, they will be saved with patience and faith. God has listed all those who belong to Him and are a part of His family in the book of life. Isn't it amazing to think that if you have given your life to Jesus Christ. It was because your name was written in the Lamb's book of life before you were even born. The Apostle Paul expressed this so eloquently to the Ephesians when he wrote, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before Him in love. What a beautiful promise we have. Now for those who thought that one beast was already more than enough for the world to tolerate. The world is about to see Satan double down, as we will study next time. John sees another. Our Heavenly Father, we do come to you tonight praising you for your word. Even though it's complicated and there's so many different ways it can be interpreted, the assurance that when it happens, those that are still on this earth, if they want to hear, they will hear and they will know and they will understand and they will be encouraged by what they see. Lord, we just praise you and thank you for this remnant of this church that is here tonight that wants to dig a little deeper and know more about your word. Lord, I praise you and I thank you for these that inspire me, that encourage me, 
And Lord, that's what you've asked us to do, encourage each other. As we go out into the world, we thank you for this sanctuary where we can prepare our hearts to take on those that need to hear what there is to hear about your word and what you have done for all humanity. We praise you and thank you. Go with us and help us to do the things that honor and glorify your name. In Jesus' precious name, amen.